Hello, I'm Michael Pierce and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about what anxiety does to your brain and what you can do about it. Anxiety is a very common American problem and worldwide problem, and very often it gets lumped in together with depression. And part of the reason for that is that anxiety and depression can occur together in bipolar disorder, it can occur together as not bipolar disorder, and it can occur in such a way that, that medications are given for both anxiety and depression that work on both conditions. So we don't fully understand what happens with anxiety, but we know a lot about anxiety and depression, even though we still have much we don't know. So let's talk about some of the things we know about anxiety. Anxiety in the brain is, has been linked in literature to differences between the frontal lobes. Now, there's, there's some controversy on this, but the general idea is if, you're, if your left hemisphere is working harder and your right hemisphere is not working as hard, you're going to have more anxiety. And if your right hemisphere, your right frontal lobe especially, is working harder than your left frontal lobe and your left frontal lobe is, is suppressed, you're going to be depressed and have lack of motivation. Now that's the general gist of the papers that talked about that, and there's been quite a lot of argument about it since. But there is some good evidence that it happens, and it became a little difficult for people to understand because there was also this confusing and confounding alpha waves, which are idle, waves of idling that make the brain a little bit slower. So um, elevated idle waves meant calmed frontal lobes, or, or reduced firing in the frontal lobes, not calmed, reduced and suppressed alpha waves meant increased activity of a particular frontal lobe. So the papers were confusing to some readers because they would say, you know, increased alpha on the left and decreased alpha on the right led to, well, gosh, what does that lead to? Well, increased alpha on the left, if this is my left hemisphere, increased alpha on the left, alpha is a slowing brain wave. It would slow your brain because a normal adult brain runs on beta waves and gamma waves. It doesn't really operate in day-to-day -day conscious living and decision-making in adult activities with alpha waves. So if alpha waves are up in their, in their activation in the left frontal lobe, the left frontal lobe is suppressed. So that's a depressed person. And likewise, their right hemisphere would be, and right frontal lobe would be, have a little more alpha in, in, in those, a little, a little more activity, a little less alpha in that case. On the other hand, let's do the other one. If there was increased alpha in the right side, that would mean that there was suppression of the cell's activity in the right side, and that person would have more activity in the left hemisphere and, and less alpha. And so that person would have anxiety because their left hemisphere is driving hard and their right hemisphere isn't. So just to summarize, anxiety represents an overactive left frontal lobe and or a suppressed right frontal lobe. Either one is possible, and it's a clinical decision you have to make because um, they're not the same thing. And uh, depression is where the left frontal lobe is inhibited in, in its output and or the right frontal lobe is overfiring. Now that's not always true, but it's a good rule of thumb. So when you look at the activities of the brain, you're going to see in anxiety most of the time elevated fast waves. So those are beta waves and, and uh, to be specific, the higher frequency beta waves and the gamma waves. These are higher frequency waves that are, you know, more than 15 cycles per second, um, more than 20 cycles per second. And, and those waves are, are faster, and you'll see elevated amount of those waves, especially in, in areas where they're driving uh, anxiety. That can happen in the frontal lobe, that can happen in the parietal lobe, and it can happen in the temporal lobe, more, more likely. And it's more likely to be in both sides at the same time if you're pretty healthy. The worse you get, the more asymmetry there is. So a patient that's a little worse off will tend to have these asymmetries in the parietal and temporal lobes. You can also get it in the occipital lobe too. I mean, you can get this problem in any lobe of the brain. But what we're talking about is normally there's more beta waves in the front of the brain and there's more alpha waves in the back of the brain if you're awake with your eyes closed. But with anxiety, you can have elevated fast waves. Another thing you can have with anxiety is something called beta spindles. And beta spindles are these bursts of short lasting beta waves that occur in, a, in an area of field in the brain, and you can see them on an EEG raw tracing very easily. So ask your doctor about beta spindling in their EEG. They can show up on eyes closed or eyes open, and they are usually regional. They're not across the whole brain, although they can be, and they're local to a part of the brain. And again, we don't like them when they're asymmetric. We, we like them more when they're symmetric and equal on both sides, 
but usually they're a, a region of the brain and they're confined and they're kind of like a little like a little area of extra activity. So look for that. We can we can train those down with neurofeedback and of, of several types and get that to reduce along with supplements and things that help stabilize the brain. So with anxiety, you can use stabilizers of the brain that are nutritional. And my favorites are very safe things like magnesium, magnesium threonate, L-threonine. These are uh, this is an amino acid that that calms the brain. I like to use for anxiety. German chamomile. I like to use tinctures of German chamomile. I like to use passion flower. I don't like to use kava kava very often because it's extremely powerful. So I don't use kava kava much. But once in a while, if somebody really needs to calm down, we'll we'll pull in kava kava. But you can't drive if you're taking a kava root or kava of any kind. The patients will sometimes take protein mixtures to support their thyroid and support their support of serotonin and dopamine. So that would be L-tyrosine and L-tryptophan. Important for anxiety to get good sleep. So I encourage my patients to get some kind of a, of a monitor system that will monitor their sleep and break it down into phases. These days you can get these devices for less than 100 bucks and often they link to your smartphone and you don't have to wear them all the time. Some people are afraid of the radi- radiation effects of EMF and so you don't have to wear them every night. But one or two nights in a row sometimes will help a person wear a wrist wearable and get a reasonable idea about their sleep. It's not as good as a sleep study laboratory, but those are very expensive. If you do need an evaluation for anxiety and, and, and some kind of sleep disorder, it can be very useful to go to a sleep lab and get a sleep EEG, which is where the patient wears a cap on their head during the sleep study. Some people are sent home for a home sleep study where the doctor sends them home with a finger monitor that monitors their pulse and oxygenation. And that's good, but it isn't an EEG and and it may not be complete at diagnosing central sleep apneas and central sleep disorders, whereas um, you you can pick up respiratory problems and, and, and cardiac problems very easily with simple monitors. But to understand the brain's central problems in, in rare cases, you need to have a sleep EEG. And you need to have a sleep certified, fellowship certified doctor that can do that. And I am not one of those. Anxiety is often helped with controlling blood glucose. When patients have insulin resistance, where their blood sugar creeps high, or they have blood sugar low, or both, which is called reactive hypoglycemia, the patient can experience real problems with anxiety and sometimes depression. Sometimes they have an underlying sleep disorder that they need to explore, and sometimes they have problems with a food sensitivity. It can be very useful to do a food diary to try to figure out if your foods are causing digestive disturbances that might be uh, contributing to anxiety. One little known thing about anxiety that I see a lot is B vitamins. Americans love to get more energy, so they buy B-complex. B-complex is cheap, and it's a bunch of B vitamins, all different kinds at too high a dose, and they take them and they feel great because they stimulate energy for a while. They're a lot like caffeine because they're a lot like a stimulant. And so the person will feel better for a while, and then they'll feel worse, and they'll feel fatigued, and it won't help them anymore. So often what happens is the person simply took a B50 that's not balanced, and they need to get off of that. Another thing that happens is the patient may have access to many supplements, and because many, many supplements are multiple ingredients, they might find that they're getting repeated B vitamins of the same kind of B vitamin at different doses in many different supplements. So they don't realize that they're taking B12 from four or five different sources, or they're taking folic acid or or 5-methylfolate from four or five different sources, or they're taking B6 in massive doses. And and I've even had patients come in and complain that they're having tachycardia and their heart is pounding out of their chest. And I say, have you had any coffee? And they're like, no, I haven't had any coffee. And it's just like a caffeine reaction. And we look at their supplements and we find that they've got five bottles of supplements out of the 10 that they take and five of them had B12 and and B6 in them. And so the person is just tripped out on their own B complex and and B vitamins. So getting rid of those and drinking a lot of water and and eating, uh, taking uh, uh, adequate minerals will help them to wash that out because B vitamins will wash out, they're water soluble, and it'll take just a couple of weeks to get that under control again. And they they can feel quite good. Lastly, we see anxiety in patients that have SNPs. There are a number of SNPs that I could go into later that have to do with the, um, the anxiety pathways in the brain, and they have to do with lingering or inadequate neurotransmitters. They have to do with the COMT genes, the CBS genes, 
the BHMT genes and the VDR, vitamin D receptor genes. And uh, these are various genes that you can test with different companies for and find out if you've inherited uh, either the typical genes or a one bad gene from one parent and one, one normal gene from the other parent, um, or two mutations, uh, one from each parent. And so those are um, uh, heterozygous or homozygous types of inheritances where you can inherit you know, just one or both genes um, that have a, a, a mutation or an error. If you have those mutations, mutations can either make enzyme activation higher or lower. And so it can get quite complex. And there's often more than one kind of gene for each of these enzymes. So you have to study these genes and, and, and study Snipedia and study with people that know more of this than, than, you, than you do, which, which is part of what I've done. And, um, and learn about what these effects are. And, and you can manipulate your form of B12. Sometimes you have to take a different kind of B12. Right now, a very popular form of B12 is methyl, methyl B12. And methyl B12 can mess up a, a, a number of people, about, I would say, between 15 and 20% of people, according to other authors, might have uh, problems with that. And they might need to switch out methyl B12, which is quite good for methylation, but it's quite bad for people that have some of these SNPs. And there may be people that have overmethylation problems, which is rare, but it does happen. You know, up to 15% of people can have overmethylation statistically. So they may need to stop taking methyl B12 and switch over to a hydroxy B12 or an adenosyl B12. They also may take cyanocobalamin, which is um, the old fashioned form of B12. And that's, um, that also may not be as useful for the, for the person. Um, so you have to experiment, and, and sometimes you can just try taking different vitamin B12s. You don't have to get an expensive gene test. You can just try it, and you'll notice a difference in, in usually a few days. Many times people that have this problem also have a problem with, with uh, folic acid, and they can't take folates or folic acid. They have to take 5-methylfolate, and they have to take a very low dose of it. And the problem is, you may be confused by the fact that I said, the methyl is bad for B12, but the methyl group is good for folic acid for these patients. So they need, uh, they need 5-methylfolate, and they don't need methyl B12. They need to remove the methyl from B12, but they need to add the methyl to folic acid. And that gets confusing because people say, well, is this methyl thing good or bad? Well, a methyl group is just a CH3 um, group that is attached to a molecule. And in some cases, we need it, and in some cases, we don't need it and it works better that way in modern society. If a person has a highly plant-based diet, they tend to be much more sensitive to this. Once they have an animal-based diet, they do a lot better with balancing this B12 and, and folate problem if they have those SNPs. So kind of a shortcut is just eat more animal products if, you're, if, you're, um, if you have these SNPs. And I know that's a shortcut, and I know it'll, it'll anger some people, but hey, I'm here to give you the shortcuts when I can. So that's a lot of things you can do for for anxiety and what you can do nutritionally and how you can figure it out and some quick things and easy things you can do to, to get control of it.